I remember at a very young age that I just didn't want that life that I was living. I knew there was something better out there. I think I can remember far back to about the age of seven years of age. I remember my fifth birthday for some reason, but really a bit of gaps and bits and pieces in between, in between there. But you know, I always knew the future was going to be something different for myself. I did know that, regardless of the situation that I was in. But I remember, you know, when I stayed in Glasgow, and I was about seven or eight years of age, and I would dog school every day. You were guaranteed I would dog school every single day. I hated school. I felt as though school done absolutely nothing for me. Um, but I don't want to promote that to a lot of young ones out there, you know, that may listen to this because education is, is genuinely, genuinely so important. But I just, I used to daydream so much. I mean, I never knew at that age I was going to do what I'm, what I'm doing today. I never, I never even gave that a, a millimetre of thought. But you know, I remember I would get up in the morning and the first thing I would think about is the guy in school always bullied me. And it was sore. It was painful, and I remember once again, I'd, I'd wet the bed, and I had another fear, because I had to hide that from my mother, you know, and um, back then people didn't really understand a lot of things like they understand now, you know, you know, you want to talk about it, is there anything happening, and you know, things like that, it, doesn't, it didn't work back then like that, and I'm quite sure anybody listening to this would understand, but this is not a sob story by any means, um, still trying to write my book but I feel as though the, um, the audio podcast might put this together and help me to go on that be a bit further but I want to talk about the day in the life of, of when I was young and then we're going to skip a few years and we're going to jump into you know what really made me want to build my future the type of person who I thought I became um, so I remember I got up in the morning and as I said I'd went to bed and I panicked and, you know, it was weird because, you know, and I really don't mind folk laughing at this, you know, because we can have a wee giggle and we're only human, but, you know, I remember I would put the sheet at the top down at the bottom thinking it would be alright and they would know, but forgetting that it would go through to the mattress. Um, never thought then to really turn the mattress round and things like that and never really thought then much about the smell because this happened on a regular basis. But I was a very nervous kid. You know, there was a lot going on. I want to leave that for the book, but very, very, very nervous. But anyway, you know, get myself ready for school. But I knew I wasn't going to school. But I'd wake up, get myself ready. <sighs> can't recall breakfast. If I did get it, I might be told different, but I can't recall it. Um, but I go up to the, the school, and I always remember it's St. Conwell's Primary School in Glasgow. And I always remember the classroom I was in. And what I would do is, I would listen outside for the register being called. And if this guy's name was called, which was nine times out of ten, he was always in, nine times out of ten, um, he would be in. So as soon as I heard his name, that was it for me. I had a day he just sort of dosing about, where was I going to go? How was I going to eat? Who was I going to meet? What was I going to see? Um, I don't 100% remember how I filled the days, but I did fill them. But the first thing I used to do was, is I used to go to the Pollocky, you know, called the Borough Collection. Now. But I would get to the Pollocky, Pollocky State, and I would start to dog school in there. This is a big, massive, massive park. I think it was one of the biggest in Europe at the time, if I'm right. And I'm talking about a young boy, seven, eight years of age, starting about people didn't really think much of that then no they would really they would, they would question it um, but I remember just dosing about and going deep into the forest and just if it was pouring the rain I would just go under a tree because I always remember my dad taught me that if it's turned on light and go under a tree probably not taking into account if it's, it's going to hit the tree it's going to go down in tapis but I remember one day I was just sitting it was pouring the rain I was hungry really hungry and it was just raining and raining, but I would rather be there in the cold, in the damp, and in the rain, than go back to school and suffer the abuse that I got off that guy. Cause that really, that really got to me. That bullying was, was really, really bad. 
but I remember just sitting there and I remember looking at this electricity box and the padlock on it. So I tried to open it. I didn't know it was the electricity box then. And I couldn't open this padlock and I searched about so or in a book you get like wire fences. So I remember breaking a bit off of this wire and I started to pick a lock and I taught myself to pick padlocks. Probably can't do that now. But I taught myself to pick padlocks, how to bend the steel and things like that with the wire. And then the padlocks would open and stuff like that. I was only eight. I was only about seven or eight years of age when I did that. So then I went bit to bit to bit, to bit opening all the padlocks. <laughs> and it was uh, it was just weird. It felt good. It was like an achievement. I mean, I didn't know. I didn't know what that meant at that age. But looking back now, it was a massive achievement that, that somebody at that age could do that. You know, I could actually unlock that. I remember I was keeping that bit of wire. It had about a million bends in it for me really working on all different padlocks. Certain locks that didn't work on, but most of them, most of them it did work. But my day was filled with, as I say, tossing about, you know, how do I get fed? How do I eat? And then I always remember um, the gypsies came to town, right? I don't know if you can say that now, right? But we will say that. Or travellers or showmen, right? Whatever, pick whatever one you want that's not going to offend you. Um, and they came to town. So I hung about with him. Hung about with him for a long time. And they used to feed me. And what would happen is they would say, right, take that hammer to so and so. Or take that wrench to so and so. Go and get that. Then they would send me to um, a lot of bakers you know, with hundreds of bottles, and you tell kids nowadays to go with the bottles, they would laugh at you. But I used to go with bags of bottles, and they would say, right, I want that, I want that, and the guy would write it all down. And then I would get to keep all the change, and this is like a lot of money, you know, so then I fun away eat, so it was like good. But what I didn't understand, or didn't really see was, was um, I was absolutely mock it, <laughs> mock it. And they used to do the shows on the Red Ash, that's what we used to call it in Glasgow, was the Red Ash. Uh, fit my pitch now, probably, whatever you call it, but we called it the Red Ash. Um, so, you're probably talking about half three, four o'clock. My, my day was spent with these guys and hanging about with them and hearing the patter, stuff like that for there. And time to get home, but I'm getting up the road and just no thinking, and I'm full of Red Ash. So then I begin to do this, my dad, and I always remember this day. <coughs> I always remember this day. I went into the house and I always mock it, man, mock it. And my dad was there and there was two other people, I can't remember who it was, he uh, was standing next to him. And he says, yeah, I've got a letter for your gran. And I was, I was all excited. I was like, oh, good, got a letter for my granny, you know. So he gave me the letter and it said on it, St. Conwell's Primary School, blah, blah, blah. My face just dropped. Your son's not been at school and this and that. And anyway, go about a doing for it. I totally deserved it. I think my dad hopped me twice in my life, do you know that? And I deserved it. Um, my dad was not violent towards me in any way or form, but he just had that mental stare where that was it. You knew, you knew when he looked, that was, you, you probably wanted to help and get it over. Um, but that side there, I, I, I could never ever see any different, you know? Um, when I hear his certain mates, they would be up seven days a week. But no, I was, um, Probably not twice in my life, got a wee scalp here and there, but no, he was never, he was never violent to me, but I did get to stare off him and, and uh, that was enough. So anyway, I got, got, my, got my ass kicked for that. But I still continued to dog school, it didn't phase me, I just, I felt as though at, even at that age I was invincible and uh, it just, it just carried on, carried on, carried on. But anyway, years, years, years ahead and I left Glasgow and came out to my level. Um, no much changes out mother will be a lot of things. Things are still sort of remain the same. Um, but then I want to skip a good few years here and I remember I keep saying fourteen was the last time I was drunk. It's actually fifteen, it was fifteen. Fifteen years of age and I remember I had a couple of mates and we were out at this party, it was a New Year thing and I was drunk, sick everywhere and everything. And I always remember my mate asking me for a fag and I used to smoke. And I had about 19, 19 fags left. It was like 20 club. You know, don't, don't we can get club now. And, in fact, you can't get 20 fags now. But I remember, and I took one out of it. And my mate says, you got a fag? 
and I, and I chucked him out of the full pack, smoked half of the fag, stubbed it out, and I said, you know what, I, I don't want this. And he went, what? And I went, this, I don't want it. I said, this isn't me, this life is just no me. It's, um, I just don't want, don't want this at all. Um, I want better than this because I know where I came from, you know what I mean? And I didn't want this to be part of my future. So I remember January, the next year on that, I started to seek out a gym. I was always into boxing and things like that. See, I'd done a bit of boxing when I was about 11, mucked about, you know, but then that was for long, that was up in St. Pat's, up in Stevenson. Top class boxing gym, old school, amazing man, Big Frank O'Connor, what a place, it just what a place. You know, spawned a lot of good guys in there. But the, um, I didn't take it serious, serious. But then I started to, to, for the age of 15, I thought, this is, this is, this is me, I'm going to start looking at gyms. So then I found this gym in Hamilton, and um, it was a Thai boxing gym, and um, I was addicted. I was absolutely addicted. Never been gripped with anything so much in all my life. And you know, I remember looking at guys in the gym, throwing punches, kicks, knees and elbows, all moving about. And I remember saying to my mate who was with me, I said, you know what, I, I'm going to be teaching this. I knew at that age, 15, you know, I was going to be teaching that sport. I knew it in my heart. And I remember about maybe six, seven months in, you know, and this had never been cocky or anything, but I used to watch certain guys do certain moves and I knew they could do it a better way. It's like, if they do that, they'll do that, they'll do that. But I'm not an instructor, I'm not a coach. You know, but my drive was getting better and better and better. So school was coming to an end as well, and it was the usual at high school. Nothing really, nothing really worked for me. It just wasn't putting it together for me. Um, I didn't want to focus on it, you know. And later, we podcasts, I'll put it together that how important that that school should have been for me. But we will come back to that. But I just dedicated my life. I dedicated my life to this sport. Morning, noon and night, morning, noon and night, I couldn't think, I couldn't sleep, nothing else but this sport. Um, I remember, as I say, my last days at school when the bell went, it was a play playtime, whatever, I used to get out of the gym and I would just practice in the gym, shadow boxing, and they, they, they punch bags or anything, but I always remember the big mats that were rolled up and um, they were there, uh, I used to punch and kick them and I felt great, I felt good, felt strong. This is probably the first time where I felt invincible. Um, where I felt, no, I'm not going to get bullied anymore. You know, I know what I can do here. I know that I'm turning around saying, look look at me, I can fight, you're dead. It's, it's not like that with me. It's never been like that with me, but inside something changed me. Something changed. And I remember what happened the first year I was there. This is something that really got me. This is where I think Stephen Mayer became Stephen Mayer who he is today. And what happened was... Um, I remember the, um, it was the end of the first year in the gym and the, the instructor sat as all doing and he was having a wee chat, nothing, nothing unusual, you know, and I remember he um, he says that, I um, can't remember the, the speech word for word, but you know, we've got a student in the gym and they put time in and this and that, he, that, he always motivated us that way, so I can't see any difference, so I've already single myself out and then my name came up and I didn't really hear it right, and then my name came up and he called me up to the front and he gave me a trophy. That's the first time I've ever been given anything in my life. That's when Stephen Mayer became Stephen Mayer. Um, is that good or is that bad? Well, I'll let some folk decide that, but um, it's weird at that age. I just, the, the, the world was there for me. And I had this trophy, and I always remember it, it was a Sammy Rice heart, beautiful, beautiful trophy. Um, I think that trophy's still with one of my family to this day, I don't know, because uh, I gave all my trophies away. Um, I felt as though I didn't need trophies, I had the memories in my head. But you know, I wanted more, I wanted more, and I think this is why I'm actually putting this wee thing out there and giving you my foundation of who I was when I was young to the now. And I wanted more, and I sacrificed my teenage days, no girlfriend, nothing, zilch. I wanted the gym, the gym, the gym, the gym, the gym. And you know something? I go where I'm at. Eventually, you know, skipping a lot here because it's quite a short one, this. I put so much effort, so much drive into that. Some people would say you lost a lot of friends through it, but you don't lose anybody because 
they see if somebody's not for you for your dream, then they're not, they're just not for you in the first place. I can, you, you think nothing, that, that becomes dead wood. And what you do is, is you get that person or persons of your life. And that's what I've done, one by one, I just got rid of them. I felt as though they just weren't a part of my life. They were still friends, but they didn't want to share my passion. And I was addicted to this, writing, doing stuff, making stuff better, visualising the day when I was going to become a coach. And then the day arrived, the day I arrived, I became a coach. And I always remember when I opened up my first class and, oh my God, I was absolutely buzzing. Everything was good, everything was great, it was going my way. And then, but, but then I wanted more. I wanted more. And I gave myself like a bucket list type thing. You know, what I wanted, I wanted a gym, I wanted a champion, I wanted champions. You know, um, I wanted this to be a part of my life. So I done it bit be bit be bit be bit be bit. But do you know what? And I hope some young ones are real, isn't it? It's because I sacrificed. I unbelievably sacrificed my teenage life to get what I wanted. This can be anything. It, you know, it's your future. You know, you can live to the age of 90 years of age, you still have to earn stuff to put things together. But see at that age you're missing out on nothing if you're sacrificing for your dream. Absolutely nothing. And I sacrificed everything. And I used to watch my mates all stunning getting a drink and this and that, never once criticised them, never criticised anything they'd done, never criticised drugs, alcohol, and anybody says different, they would be a liar because I've never criticised it because my dad used to say, don't say you never will, just say you, you hope you won't. And I learned from that because I could wake up one day and something could change in me where I become that part in my life. So, dedication. And I want to put this out there to a lot of young ones, and it's like where they're going in life, what they want to do. And I hope some parents will put this and say to them, just listen to it. Even if it's wee segments, they want to listen to it. Put your all in when you're younger. It's the learning years, I'm telling you right now. It's the learning years. Because later on, it's the earning years. And you really want to be putting things together that you want to achieve, whether it be sport, whether it be the job you want, whether it be your driving lessons or whatever. And I, I encourage young ones to keep working and working and working and working. But do you know what? There was another evil on the other side, and I'm going to call it the word evil, because see as much as you're trying to put yourself out there for, you know, like, um, to be successful, there's people who want to see you fall. And the people that want to see you fall could be the people that's closest to you, and that's the sad bit about it. But did they want to see you and they, you know they might turn around and say you're doing amazing oh did you not get it don't be daft you're alright but they're probably gloating behind the scenes and I've witnessed it I've saw it but I didn't see it about it but please anybody that's not for you in your dream please they're dead with your life and you have to get rid of them um, don't say well they're blood or this or that it doesn't matter it's your future it's your life and I want you to live it so just a wee short podcast there on Stephen Mert on where I've been and where I still want to go at the age of 52 years of age. And I'll do another one of these. This used to be episode one. And I'll build on everything else that I put forward. I'll talk about how I got my first champion and things like that for there. So this is just a wee short and sweet one for here. And um, I hope you like it. But there's more to come. I remember at a very young age that I just didn't want that life. I was loving.